Welcome back to our series on cloud native application development. I am Jamie Lan, a senior consultant for application development at Red Hat, and on this video, we're going to take a look at setting up security with OpenAPI. Now to do this, we're going to go back to Apicurio. I'm going to use the API that we originally designed in the first lab. If you didn't design that uh, or you no longer have it, uh, you can just create a new API. It doesn't matter whether it's blank or, or if it's one of the example APIs, um, but you should be able to follow along regardless. So when we originally created our, our API, I explained how to fill in all this information, creating data types and paths. Um, one piece that I sort of skipped over are the security schemas and security requirements piece down here. Uh, so security schemas is how we define how we want to access our application. Um, and security requirements is how we want to, how we define how we want to apply that access across our application. So security schemas will tell us um, what type of security we want and requirements will tell us what endpoints we want to apply that to. So if we click add security schema, uh, you can see it just takes a name, a description, and a security type. So we'll call ours to do security. And just our general security. And then inside of this type, you can see there are these four different types that we can choose from. Uh, these are all the basic types that are supported by uh, OpenAPI 3. So the HTTP is the most basic type. This is just going to be your authorization header. So authorization header colon something. Uh, inside of there, we are there are three different schemas that you can use. The basic is just going to be basic space, and then it's going to be username colon password, um, and that's going to be base64 encrypted. Uh, it's the easiest, but also the easiest to decrypt um, security. You know, if you do use basic, make sure to do it over SSL. Really, if you use any security, make sure to do it over SSL. Uh, digest is similar to basic. Uh, the big difference there is it actually requires two calls to whatever you're trying to authenticate against. The first call is going to be unauthorized, but it's going to come back with a notes, which is essentially just a random number. And then you're going to use that number to create a hash that you're actually going to do the authentication with. Bearer is a, a token that you're going to be getting from another application, uh, any other sort of login. Uh, it can be part of an OAuth 2 flow, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, essentially, it's just it's just a specification of a, a type of um, token that you're going to be getting from some other service somewhere out there. Uh, the next set on the list of security types is API key. Uh, API key is basically if you either want to do your security through cookies or, or query parameters for some reason, you can, and you're just going to give the name of the query parameter or if you have your own way of doing security through headers that doesn't involve the authorization header, um, you can do that. For example, if you wanted to, you could just um, you could just take your password into plain text. I wouldn't, but you could do that. Uh, and then the next on the list is probably the most commonly used um, authorization type uh, currently out there. All the big guys, Facebook and Google's use it. And that's OAuth 2. Now, OAuth 2 actually works through a flow. So there's a lot of calls and a lot going on in the back end. So I'm going to do a practical example. And one quick note before I do this, um, feel free to try and follow along. But OAuth 2 is a, a fairly complicated flow. And it takes a couple times of looking at it to wrap your mind around it. Uh, I'll include a graph in the lab instructions. And I would recommend just kind of looking at it and don't feel too bad if you don't completely understand it the first time. So we can see here we're on the Epicurio site. Uh, when I click try it live, it wants me to log in. Uh, on the left hand side here, we can see username and password or email and password in this case. And this is how I would log into Epicurio directly. This is actually, I believe, probably a type of OAuth2 flow called password flow. Um, but we're going to use a different type of OAuth2 flow, which are these two pieces here. So you can see there's a GitHub button and a Google button. Now, GitHub and Google are in no way associated with Apicurio. These are just ways to authenticate for Apicurio. So what that means is when I click GitHub, 
I'm now going to be in github.com and I'm going to be logging in to GitHub, not into Apicurio. And Apicurio will have no knowledge of these credentials. So you can see that after I logged into Apicuria, or after I logged into GitHub, excuse me, um, it actually redirected me back to Apicurio. And Apicurio says user with name, J or email jland at redhat.com already exists. So not only did it redirect me back, but it passed back some data about me from GitHub. So this, this information here came from GitHub. So what happened here? was GitHub passed an authorization code back to Apicurio. Apicurio then used that authorization code to retrieve an access token. And that access token had a bunch of different information. It had a token type. It had an expiration date. It had a refresh token for refreshing it. Potentially and probably had some information about me in there. Um, but importantly, it had an access code. And now, Apic, now that Apicurio has that token, then it can use that access code in order to ping the GitHub server and get information about me um, based on that access code. So for example, if I click here and I click try it again live, this time when I click GitHub, I won't be put into the login page. I will just be put directly into this um, note about asking me to merge accounts. And the reason for that is because now Apicurio already has that token on the back end, so it doesn't need me to log in again. Now, you can see there's a couple different flow types. The flow type I just described is the authorization code flow type. And you can see here it takes the authorization URL. That is the URL that forwarded me to the login page. It also has a token URL and a refresh URL. Uh, token URL is what the access code um, is used against. So the refresh URL is, if different than the token URL, a way uh, that you can refresh your token once it expires. Uh, the idea behind an authorization code is this is most web services out there are going to be using this flow. Um, it's The idea is that you log into the server, you get the token, you store the token in your database or wherever, and then you can use that to keep that user, you know, essentially logged in forever um, unless they revoke access. The implicit flow is similar to the authorization code. The difference is you don't actually get the token. You just stop at the access code and you use the access code to access the server. Um, what that means is, A, that access code is short-lived. So if the user comes back at a future time, you're not going to be able to use that access code. You're going to have to force him to log in again. Um, but uh, you also don't need to, for that reason, you don't need to store it. So a lot of like single page applications are going to be using the implicit um, security schema just because they can't or don't want to store the user's information. Um, the next set is password. Password is if you do need to take the client credentials. So keep in mind that when I did the login through GitHub, I never typed in my client credentials into Apicurio. I only typed it into github.com so that there was no reason for Apicurio to have any idea what my client credentials for GitHub were. Password is you're taking in the client credentials. And the only reason you would want to do that is if you are the first party application for whatever you're trying to do your OAuth against. So, um, for example, if we go back to uh, the login page, so you can see here, this one is taking a username and password. Um, this might be doing the authentication in a different way, but there's a good chance that this is also doing OAuth2 authentication um, against one of their internal um, resource servers somewhere or authentication server somewhere. And in this case, since Apicurio is the first party, they would be required to take in the password as well. Uh, the last one is client credentials. This one's actually the simplest of all the flows, and this is just machine to machine. So in your microservice architectures, this is how they're gonna talk to each other. Uh, the big difference here is rather than taking in a password or redirecting to a login page, you just pass in a client secret.
So the last security type that I want to talk to you guys about today um, is this OpenID Connect. Now, OpenID Connect is actually an implementation of OAuth 2.0. Uh, OAuth 2.0 is just a framework or protocol that describes how the authorization works, but it doesn't specify the implementation. So OpenID Connect is actually the authorization code flow. Um, and the first thing that you'll notice if you look at the OpenID Connect is uh, it just takes this one connect URL where the authorization flow takes an auth URL, token URL, refresh URL, and all the scope information. The reason that OpenID Connect URL only takes one URL is because this is actually going to point to a config file that's going to contain all that other, other information. Um, so for example, uh, we are soon going to create a, a configuration to connect against the local key cloak server that I have set up. Um, if we take a quick look, uh, we can see um, that'll be the realm we will create. Um, we can see for the, the master realm in that key cloak server, the OpenID connect URL. And that's got our token endpoint, our authorization endpoint, all those things that we had to manually input, as well as um, supported scope information here at the bottom uh, and, and a bunch of other information. Um, and the way that you specify this is just going to be whatever your authorization server is. And it's going to be slash dot well known, well dash known slash um, and then it'll just be open ID configuration uh, so for for us we're actually going to use this to do realm for our open ID configuration so I'm just gonna go ahead and save here um, so now you see we have the security schema uh, currently it's not going to be applied to any of our endpoints because we haven't set up our security requirements uh, now, first, if you wanted to just set up the security schema against a single endpoint for whatever reason, uh, you can do that just by clicking into these endpoints here on the uh, API. And then you can set up the security requirement here. Click the checkbox, click save. And then if you look at the source, um, you can see that on this endpoint, we've got this security tag and this to do security which is gonna to point to our open API uh, security schema that we just set up. Uh, now for our purposes, we actually are just going to, instead of setting it up for a specific endpoint, um, we are going to, we're going to set it up for the entire application. And the way that we're gonna do that is by hitting the security schema here. Um, so we're gonna click this, we're just going to click the checkbox. Uh, if we did define specific scopes, you could um, check specific scope information, um, but we didn't in our case. We'll click save. And then if we look at our source, we'll see something similar to what we just saw, uh, only it's going to be at the application level instead of the operation level. And we can see that this is where our security schema was set up. So the first thing that we're going to do here is we're just going to copy uh, the security schema information to our to-do YAML file. So we're going to go to our to-do.yaml, and we're going to go into our components, and then we're going to paste this at the component level. Um, so I actually want to move this guy back a little bit. You can see it's at the same level as uh, our data schema here. And we have our security requirements set here. So now that we've got that set up, let's generate the sources real quick. And so the only difference you're gonna see with the Spring Boot generator and the generated sources is when we come to this to-dos API controller, we're gonna now see, um, oh, sorry, the inside of the generator, the to-dos API um, dot Java. Uh, we're now gonna see this new, um, annotation here at authorization that references our to-do security. Uh, now one just quick note is this is actually, in my opinion, handled better by OpenAPI 3.0's Swagger implementation, but currently uh, OpenAPI Generator uses Swagger 2's uh, annotation. So even though it can read a 3.0 document, it's going to be doing all this in 
2.0 annotations that hopefully will change soon. And when it does, we'll come back and make a new video to go over those changes. Um, but now that we have our annotations there, the next thing we need to do is actually set up our security. Now, the way that we're going to do that is using something called Keycloak. Keycloak is an identity management uh, service that is open source. So I have actually an instance of it running locally on my machine, and there are instructions in the lab on how to do that. And I have it on port 8081. Uh, so we're going to go into our administration console and log in. And you can see our Keycloak server. Um, now everything's split up on realms. Uh, every realm is going to be totally separate from one another. They don't share users or anything. Uh, so you can see there's this master realm that's set up for us by default, but we're going to create a new realm and we're just going to call it to do realm. Um, and you can import a file to specify all this. We're going to do it all by hand. So now that we've created this realm, we're going to create a client. Uh, the client in this case is how we're actually going to connect to our Keycloak server. You can see there's a couple of these already set up for us. Uh, we're going to create a new one. We're going to call it uh, OpenID Login Client. And it's going to use the OpenID Connect protocol. All right, so now we have this client. Uh, the only other thing that we need to do is specify valid URLs. Um, so these are just the URLs that are allowed to call this client. In our case, we're going to be calling it locally. So we're just going to put in local host and then my, my service is going to be running on port 8080. Um, but if you had, uh, you know, other, um, environments, production environments, uh, you could put those domains in here as well. So we'll save this and now we're going to create some roles. And we can use these roles to um, restrict access to certain parts of our application. So we are going to add a read access role. And we will also add a write access role. And then the last thing that we need to do here is just set up a user. Uh, normally you'll do this with the application, but we're just going to create one here. So we'll call this guy to do user. Um, we'll give him an email name and we will say he has a verified email for now. And, uh, inside of here, we're just going to go ahead and just give him a password. And finally, we are going to give him, for now, we'll just give him the read access role. And then we're pretty much all set here. Now let's go take a look at the code. Now in the code, um, the only changes I needed to make uh, in order to make the key cloak security work are inside of the palm.xml and inside of the properties. So we look at the palm.xml, I added this new dependency, uh, Keycloak Spring Boot Starter. And then all I needed to do was add some configuration properties and then Spring was able to auto configure the rest for me. So you'll see that I have the authorization server and that's gonna point to localhost 8081, which is where my Keycloak server is running, slash auth. I specify the to-do realm that we specified before um, and then this key cloak resource, I'm specifying the client that we had created, the open ID dash login dash client. And then in our case, it's a public client. So the way that we actually specify security on the specific endpoints are these security constraints below. Uh, so we specify the authorized role in this case, read access, then we'll specify the patterns that that role has out, um, access to. In this case, it's the two to do endpoints, uh, or paths. And then the authorized operation. So in this case, it's get. Write also has access to the to-do endpoint, but it also has access to the get, put, post, and delete security methods. Um, so now that we've got this code set up, let's start the server and see how this runs. Okay, 
So we've started our application. And now if we go to our Um, if we try to hit one of our get endpoints, we're actually right now going to get this type error failed to fetch. Um, so this is, uh, this is, there's an issue with, uh, trying to use swagger to hit this endpoint the initial time, because what's happening again in the back end with the OAuth 2 is it's trying to redirect us to a new web page, and currently this version of Swagger doesn't support it. The newer version will actually have an authorized button at the top that does. Um, but for our purposes, all we need to do to fix that is just copy this URL and then paste it into a different window. You can see we got redirected to our to-do realm. And inside of here, we want to log in with that to-do user that we created. And now you can see that we were able to get a response back. So at this point, now that we've done the login, um, as I mentioned earlier in the lab, the token's actually gonna be saved in the web application. So what that means is when we come back to the Swagger page and we click execute, we're gonna get a 200 because now it's just using the access code of the token it already has. It doesn't need to redirect us. Now, if we attempt to hit uh, this post endpoint, and we should get an unauthorized response, which we do. The reason being is that we don't have the read access or the write access. So if we go back here, change the attributes to give us the write access, and then we attempt to hit it, you're gonna see we still get that 403. Now that's because it's using information inside of that access token. So for an or in order for us to update that token to include this assigned role information, we're gonna to need to get a new token. Um, so the easiest way to do that is just to restart our server real quick. So let's do that. So now that we restarted our server, we should be able to hit this endpoint, which should refresh our token. And then now when we hit this right, you can see that we get a 201 and it works. So at this point, we've, we've set up our security. Uh, we set up our, our annotations. And by the way, you'll know the annotations are set up because you can see this little lock symbol. Um, the last thing I want to show you here is this open API controller, which you'll notice doesn't have the lock symbol because we're not covering that with our authorization annotations. So I'm going to go back to the code real quick to show you what's happening on the back end. So I created this controller as a way to illustrate the thin layer that the OpenID Connect puts on top of the normal OAuth 2 flow. And namely, uh, that, that layer is this ID token that you see here. So you can see what's actually happening is we're grabbing the key cloak security context from the HTTP requests. And while some of that part is unique, this ID token is not unique to key cloak, but rather a, a specification of the OpenID Connect. And inside of this ID token, it actually holds a ton of information. So when I click this try it out button, uh, we should get uh, you, the user information. So you can see here, we've got uh, name, given name, family name, preferred username, email address. So this is uh, actually includes a lot of the user information that you're gonna need or that you would typically want when you're authorizing your user against someone else's server. Um, and that's just useful because uh, it means that you don't have to go back to the server. It's also a little bit more well formatted and well known since it's part of the OpenID Connect specification. Uh, so at this point, we've, we've set up our server. Uh, we have added uh, security schemas and security requirements to our OpenID Connect. And we've been able to use a key cloak server, a key cloak server that we set up locally to validate all that. Um, there's a lot more that you can do. There's a lot more to learn and I'll include more materials in the lab about all that. Um, but I encourage you guys to spend some time and, and look up a lot of this information yourself. Um, security is a, a huge subject that is generally ignored. Um, so it's always good to learn more about it uh, until next time.